uh, assistant professor at NYU. So Matt uh, started uh, his career at Stanford, where he got his PhD. Then uh, he moved to the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. And after that, he went directly to uh, NYU. And he's going to tell us today how to watch uh, World Scholar. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks for the invitation. Um, <coughs> so I understand that this is an astrophysics seminar. And so Brees uh, instructed me to give a long introduction and to try to uh, make it a little less technical than, than I might otherwise. So I'll try to do that. But please interrupt me with questions. Um, <coughs> actually, I gave a, a seminar um, on a previous stage of this in the physics department last uh, spring. Um, but there have been some, there's been some recent progress. So, so, so there's some stuff in here that's new, if, if you happen to see that last, uh, last seminar. Okay, I'll try to speak up. <coughs> so here's an outline. Um, I'll give some introduction and motivation. Uh, I'll very briefly tell you the aspects of string theory that you need to know in order to understand this talk. Uh, I'll talk about um, uh, tunneling from, from a false vacuum state. I'll tell you what, what, what this is. And, um, and then I'll come to the case that I'm actually interested in where we consider collisions of cosmological bubbles and, and ask uh, whether there are observables in cosmology, things that we could see in cosmology that would test this picture. So this is based on um, some completed papers, uh, some work in progress, um, and, and quite a bit of past work uh, by a number of people. <coughs> okay. So I want to start with just a general observation, which is that when you want to study elementary particle physics, you, you need access to very, very high energies. And the reason is very simple. It's, it's just the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. If you want to study something of size d, then you need an energy uh, that scales roughly like 1 over d, um, just in order to get close enough to that thing in order to be able to resolve it. And so if we want to study elementary particle physics, generally we build particle accelerators. And uh, we go to great uh, expense and spend a lot of time building these giant machines to accelerate particles to extremely high energy, and, and therefore we can see uh, very small things. Um, <coughs> but of course, the problem with this is that, as you all know, particle accelerators are very complex. That's been an issue recently. Um, they're extremely expensive, and it's not so clear what the future is. Uh, there's, there's certainly limits that come just from the laws of physics. There's, there's a limit to how much you can accelerate something with an accelerator that's no bigger than the Earth, let's say. Um, and, uh, and there are, of course, limits from politics and, and economics and so forth. So, so this is um, a field that, uh, that's a little unclear what's, what's happening with it in the future. Now, I'm primarily interested in string theory. And string theory is a, is a subject that's, that's famously very difficult to test experimentally. And the reason for that is essentially that it describes objects um, which differ from standard particles only when you get down to substructures which are extremely, extremely small. Energy scales that are of order 10 to the 13 TeV. So for the astrophysicists, if you prefer ergs, a TeV is roughly an erg, a factor of 1.6 or something. But so this is an enormous amount of energy for a single particle to carry. And if conventional string theory models are correct, that's how much energy you would need in your particle accelerator to be able to actually produce, um, well, to, to tell the difference between string theory and a more conventional theory. And actually, this, is not, this goes for more than just string theory. There are good reasons to think that something dramatic happens to physics at around this scale. Um, if it's not string theory, it's something else. But something happens there. Uh, and so it's very interesting to probe uh, these scales if it's at all possible to do. But unfortunately, the, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN can only reach a few TeV in energy. And, um, and so, so there's 13 orders of magnitude uh, that we have to overcome if we want to test this. And that's not going to happen with a particle accelerator. It's completely impossible. Now, of course, it could be that this is in uh, the most conventional string models and, and sort of the simplest ones. There are uh, other ideas that say that it could be the string scale is much lower than this, in which case it could even be tested at the LHC. Uh, but, but I think in the, in the simplest and uh, most probable models, um, th this is actually the energy scale where these effects become important. OK, so is there, any, is there anything we can do about that? Can we look elsewhere? Is there something else? that we could look for. So since this is an astro seminar, it's obvious what the answer is. Um, I mean, we know that the 
we know that as we run time backwards in the universe, it contracted, the temperature increased. And if we go back far enough, the temperature got arbitrarily high, the density got arbitrarily high. And uh, at some point it reached a scale where no particle accelerator could ever reach. Now, um, and not only that, it, this is actually a place where, where it's the one place where we know quantum gravity was important. If we go far enough back towards the Big Bang, um, at some point quantum corrections to classical gravity, to Einsteinian uh, gravity, must have become important. And so that, that's actually sort of an extra motivation even if you're studying string theory because string theory is a theory of quantum gravity as well as a theory of particle physics. But in general, um, there's this opportunity if we, if we could somehow uh, understand or, or see some traces of the physics that took place in this early phase of the universe, we might be able to learn something about uh, particle physics. Okay, so here's a, a slide with an obligatory picture of a galaxy, which really has not much to do with the rest of the talk. Um, but, but this does, and, and this does to some extent. Um, so, so just a general comment about cosmology. As, as you all know, we're in what some people call a golden age for cosmology. Cer certainly, many things are happening. It's becoming a precision science. We can measure cosmological observables to 1% in some cases, even better in some cases. Um, and and so, so th there's a very rich source of data here. And not only that, there's actually, um, there really is this opportunity that I just described because uh, if the standard model for cosmology is correct, then um, in the early universe, there was a period of exponential expansion, inflation. Um, and the energy scale during inflation was very, very high. We don't know exactly what it was, but it's, it could have been um, not so far from, from this 10 to the 13 TeV figure that I, that I put up earlier. So there was, there was a period in the universe's expansion when it, when it had this very high, uh, when the energy densities were very high. And moreover, uh, we can actually directly see the effects of that when we look at the CMB. So I think this is an absolutely, I mean, it's, it's, it's something you all know, but I think it's, it's really worth emphasizing that this is an amazing opportunity. It's, it's, there's nothing else like it. Uh, we're never gonna be able to build an accelerator which, um, which could probe physics at these scales. So maybe we can learn something from, from large scale structure and cosmology. Okay, so, so uh, <coughs> Um, well, it depends on what your assumptions are. Size are you allowed to of the size of the Earth? I don't remember. I did this calculation sometime. I don't remember, but it's you know or a few orders of magnitude. If it's if it's a if it's a circular accelerator, you lose from synchrotron radiation. If it's linear, you run out of space pretty rapidly. Um, so I don't know. It's 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 some orders of magnitude above above the LHC, but and then maybe you can build one the size of the solar system. I don't know, but you know it's it's. Uh, <laughs> It's certainly not going to happen in our lifetime. Um, okay, so, so, so what about inflation? Um, so inflation serves, roughly speaking, two functions, um, which we like, generally. One thing it does is it homogenizes the universe. It inflates, it, it stretches it so quickly that any initial inhomogeneity uh, or, or, or initial um, density of whatever was, was there initially gets, gets, um, gets expanded away, it just inflates away. So that's one thing it does. But it doesn't create a universe which is completely homogeneous because uh, quantum, quantum fluctuations during inflation um, end up imprinting themselves on the energy density. And that has to do with the fact that there's a horizon uh, during inflation. It's, it's a phenomenon very similar to Hawking particle production in a black hole. But anyway, so inflation does both of these things for us simultaneously. And if we want to use inflation, if we want to use this stage of the universe as a probe of high energy physics, there are roughly two types of effects we could look for. There are effects which took place during inflation. So for example, these quantum fluctuations of the inflaton could be modified by some interesting physics. Or there could be some interesting initial state which inflation didn't succeed in completely removing. Of course, no normally you want, I mean, one of the reasons we like inflation is that it removes imprints of the initial state. Uh, and um, for these purposes, I'm taking sort of the opposite view. Maybe there's something left of this initial state uh, that we could still see. And actually, that's what I'm going to focus on, although this is also an interesting um, an interesting thing to think about. Okay, so that's um, that's some motivation. Um, now I'm going to, to explain string theory to you. Um, <coughs> so uh, one starts in string theory by replacing point particles. So theories of particle physics are theories of point particles, and uh, one replaces those with what we call strings. If you think of point particles as zero-dimensional objects. They have no width, breadth, or height. Strings are one-dimensional objects. They have a length. 
Um, Feynman diagrams, if you're familiar with them, um, get promoted to uh, surfaces. So instead of having lines for particles, one has these world sheets. Um, because the string has some structure, it can, it, it can do more than just sit there and perhaps have a spin. It can actually rotate and it can vibrate. Its vibrational modes are quantized for the same reason that a guitar string uh, has a fundamental mode and, and, uh, and some harmonics. And it turns out that depending on the mode the string is vibrating in, it has different properties. It can look like an electron, it can look like a photon. Uh, <coughs> and in fact, it can also look like a graviton. And if you have enough such strings, it can look like classical gravity. How would you draw a Feynman diagram for open strings? For open strings, uh, you, would, you would cut this open. So the, the world sheet would have a boundary. <coughs> so, and one of the great surprises of this was, in fact, that it, it was not originally envisioned as a theory of gravity. It was envisioned as a theory of the strong interactions. Um, it didn't do such a great job as a theory of the strong interactions, but it turned out uh, that whether you like it or not, gravity comes out automatically. It's not something that you put in, and it's not something you can really avoid. So there's something extremely compelling about this theoretically. You start with this idea, you work through the math, and Einstein's uh, equations pop out the other end. <coughs> All right. So here's an executive summary. As I said, it's, a, it's naturally a theory of gravity, and it's also naturally a quantum theory. We understand how to quantize it, and that's not something we know how to do in any other version of quantum gravity, if there even is such a thing. Um, it unifies the forces in the sense that one can construct, well, you start with this simple idea, and, and from that, you can easily construct models in which there are many forces. Uh, getting exactly the standard model of particle physics is a, a great challenge, but, um, but it's, it seems to be within reach. And unlike other attempts to quantize gravity, the theory is finite. You don't end up having infinities that you don't understand. So these are sort of virtues of string theory. These are, uh, are things that we have to deal with. Um, one is that there are 10 dimensions. This is, not, again, not something you get to choose. So we have to do something with six of them, since we only see, when I say 10 dimensions, I'm including time. So we have to do something with the other six. Uh, string theory is, is only well-defined when it's supersymmetric. We know the world is not supersymmetric, at least fully. And so um, one has to break supersymmetry in some way. And the third difficulty, the one that I'm really going to, the only one that I'm actually going to focus on at all, um, is, is that there are many, many, many solutions to it. And I'll tell you what I mean by that in a second. Yeah, first of all, I have to explain very briefly what to do with these extra six dimensions. Um, so it turns out that um, if you have a dimension which is compact, and what I mean by that is if you move in some direction, you come back to where you started after a finite amount of, uh, of distance. So for example, the surface of the Earth, if you were stuck to the surface of the Earth, you move in any direction, you come back to where you started. That's a compact space. It's perfectly consistent to consider uh, some of these 10 dimensions in string theory to be compact. And if they're very small, if you only have to move a very short distance before you come back to where you started, you can't see them. They have no effect on uh, microscopic physics. And um, it turns out that they do affect particle physics. They, 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 they uh, change the spectrum of particles that you see. But it's not something that you can go take a walk in these extra dimensions. They're, um, they're extremely small and uh, can only be seen at very high energies. OK, but it turns out there are many ways to do that. There are many different kinds of compact six-dimensional manifolds that one can use. And I'm not going to tell you really anything about that, except to say that there are many, many options. So the fact that there are so many options um, has led to a difficulty, which is, that, um, which is that there are many, many possible versions of string theory where you compactify on a different manifold in each case. Uh, in fact, it's not only these, it's not just the manifold that you get to choose. It's not just the geometry of that space that you get to choose. Uh, there's also some, um, some other numbers that are associated with it that you can pick. And just to get a sense of, of the number of possibilities that there are, uh, these manifolds are six-dimensional. And um, six factorial is something that comes out rather naturally. It's, it's sort of like uh, if you could pick any, I don't know, pair of directions, then um, so numbers like if you have d dimensions, d times d minus 1 will come out. I don't really want to explain where this comes from, and it's not very precise. But just numbers of order, six factorial, you can imagine how that would come out. You get to choose different directions, uh, different too combinations large. of directions. What's that? That's not too large. It's not too large. That's right. Um, however, uh, each of those directions, um, there's, there's, there's an integer associated with, which has to do with a number of units of flux which wraps in that direction. And um, that flux is quantized. 
Roughly speaking, uh, in a conventional string compactification, you may have 10 options, let's say 0 through 10. 6 factorial is 720. Numbers like 10 to the 500, one integer for each of these 6 factorial possibilities, can easily come out of something like this. OK, so this is a gigantic, ridiculously, absurdly large number. Um, and you know, this is the number, let's say, of possible string theories. Uh, so so that's, that's a problem. Um, it's not actually very surprising. If you think about a single protein, so this picture is stolen from some talk on biophysics, think about a protein, it's a sequence of amino acids. Uh, it can fold, roughly speaking, in a couple of directions at each join between two amino acids. There's hundreds of amino acids in a protein. There are uh, three or four or whatever to the 100 possible configurations of such a protein. And um, most of them, or many of them anyway, are actually stable in the sense that the protein can fold to that configuration and vibrate. Uh, with a uh, small amplitude around it. If you give the protein a big kick, it may end up in a different configuration about which it can also vibrate. And so there's an energy landscape um, with many, many minima. And, um, okay. and so actually this is where this term comes from. I think it was originally used in either biophysics or in statistical mechanics. But anyway, it's just an energy landscape. There are many possibilities. And string theory is like that. There are many ways you can compactify it. Each of them is locally stable. You can um, the, the theory, what, if you put it in that state, will remain in that state, at least for some time. Um, but, there, but there are many such things. Glasses give you the state. What does? The glasses. Clusters? Did you? Oh, glasses. glasses. Sorry. Yes, absolutely. That's right. Just about anything. In fact, it's, it's sort of ubiquitous. It's, it's really, the minute a theory becomes more than trivially, uh, you know, just slightly complex, it's, 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 very, it's very common that things like this arise. Um, OK. So I just want to say one other thing about this. These different minima in string theory can be thought of as something like phases, as in phase transition. Um, so um, uh, we can imagine that the universe, um, some part of the universe, is, is sitting in one of these minima. That means in, the, in that part of the universe, the compact dimensions take a particular shape. Um, but that minimum is just one of many possibilities. There are many other shapes it could take. And there can be transitions where this compact dimensions change shape. And those transitions are first order because the minimum you're in is metastable. In other words, if you're in a minimum, the only way you can get out is by tunneling. You have to make a sudden transition from that minimum to another. It's very much like uh, supercooling um, a solution below the point where it should, um, you know, where, where something should condense out of it. And then if you tap it, it suddenly crystallizes. So you can be in situations like that where you're, you're stuck in one of these minimum, which is not the global minimum, it's a local minimum. And some process which either gives you enough energy to get over the barrier or just quantum mechanics can, can tunnel you down into the global minimum. OK. But, but when we're talking about universe, yes. you mean uh, oh, yes. they are different in this causally disconnected patches? Well, if they're, yeah. So in some cases, they're causally disconnected. And in some cases, they become causally connected, which is actually the most interesting uh, situation. Yeah, sure, right. You cannot envisage transition between causally disconnected. That's right, yeah. So in fact, these transitions, when they take place, are local. They, 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 they take place in a, in a localized region. And I'll, I'll describe that in, in, just, in just a minute. OK, so, so I want to make a claim, um, which is that this picture, uh, it's actually somewhat independent of string theory, really. But this, this idea that there is this uh, landscape of minima, um, these different phases that regions of the universe can inhabit, is actually predictive and falsifiable. Um, and we can test it with cosmology. Um, and, and the reason it's, it's predictive and falsifiable is that it predicts a very special type of Big Bang in our past. So it predicts a particular initial condition for inflation. And that's something we can actually look for. Now, there's, you'll notice a footnote here, which is too small for you to be able to read. So unfortunately, no, uh, I have to make some assumptions um, in, or, in order to make this claim. But um, I think I'm actually not going to, well, I'll, I'll put them up here. But they're relatively technical. Um, so, so string theorists and particle physicists may be interested in this. But um, in any case, there's some set of assumptions which boil down to we can describe this uh, string theory landscape using what's called effective field theory. We, we don't actually have to think that much about string theory. We can describe it using a set of scalar fields. Um, <coughs> OK. But unless there are questions, um, go on. OK, so, so what, is the, what are these uh, falsifiable predictions? Well, it turns out that, um, that the universe we live in must be open. It must have negative spatial curvature, if this model is correct. It must be open. <coughs> so That's what, what was the last assumption? Yeah. Uh, 
Oops. This, this, these are sort of in order of, of decreasing uh, controversiality. Th this one is almost certainly correct. Um, but, uh, okay. all right. Um, right. So, so, so first of all, the, the, the spatial curvature must be negative. If the spatial curvature turns out to be positive, then, um, then this is simply falsified. I won't say that that falsifies string theory. It, it doesn't quite, but it certainly falsifies a very broad set of ideas. Um, and so I think that's, that's an exciting thing because it's, as I said, difficult to find. Um, predictions like that in string theory. Um, uh, now, if the curvature turns out to be zero to the precision with which we can measure it, that unfortunately doesn't falsify it because it could be negative and it's just too small to measure. A long period of inflation would, uh, would produce something like that. So, so, uh, uh, how, um, so any positive will falsify? Yes. Right. If it's positive to however sigma you decide to be convinced by, that, uh, that would rule it out. <coughs> Wait, say that again? If, if the curvature is positive yeah. uh, and you're convinced because it's positive to five sigma or three sigma or whatever, yeah. then that rules out this class of models. In these models, the curvature must be negative, but it can be arbitrarily close to zero right. because inflation can, can inflate it away. <coughs> so it's falsifiable. Um, and it's also predictive, and, um, and that's, that's, what, that's what I'm going to describe. And one of, the, one, of the, one of the ways that's predictive and one of the things that we could see is we could see signatures not just of this special Big Bang, this origin of our own bubble, but of collisions with other bubbles. And that's actually uh, something that, well, so that's, that's what I'm going to, to describe. Um, <coughs> all right. Okay, so I have to tell you a little bit about this process that produces these regions, these bubbles. Why I call them bubbles at all. Um, and, and, okay. So, um, so in string theory, we have all of these metastable minima. Again, metastable means locally stable. You can, you can vibrate around it, um, but the, the energy there is not the global minimum, and so there's a preferred minimum somewhere else. If there's a preferred minimum, quantum mechanics will eventually take you to it, unless there's some absolute rule forbidding it. Quantum mechanics will do everything that's possible, and it takes you towards lower energy. So eventually, you know that if you're in a, a metastable minimum that's not the global one, you'll, you'll have to tunnel out of it. Uh, in quantum mechanics, in one-dimensional quantum mechanics, this is a very familiar thing. You can imagine starting in some little well, and so let's say this actually goes out to infinity, so this is zero. Um, the wave function will gradually leak out, or if you think of semi-classically, a particle bouncing around in here, it will eventually tunnel through this barrier. You can describe that process in various ways. The nicest way, for my purposes, is using something called an instanton. Um, you can also describe it using the WKB approximation in quantum mechanics. But, you know, it just involves some, uh, some classically forbidden process where even though your energy is below the height of this barrier, you tunnel through. When this happens in more than one dimension, what appears is a bubble, a, uh, at least roughly spherical region. So in a one-dimensional problem, you just tunnel through a barrier. In more dimensions, um, it's, it's, it's a bubble. It's a bit like a bubble in a glass of beer. Uh, <coughs> so these, these bubbles appear. Um, and, um, and in these models, at least, because the energy is lower inside, there's a force on the bubble walls that makes them want to expand because you want to expand, you, know, you want to lower your energy by increasing the amount of, uh, of, um, of lower vacuum inside. So, um, so when these bubbles appear, they, they, they rapidly expand. And because we're talking about a particle physics model, the rate at which they expand is extremely fast compared to any cosmological time, let's say. Which means they accelerate to the speed of light, or almost the speed of light, in a fraction of a second. And so you may as well think of the walls of this bubble as simply propagating out, expanding out at the speed of light. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think we know. I don't think anything that I've said is uh, is I mean, too much of an extrapolation. We have some examples where, where where we know, but it's true that in general we don't. Um, we don't have complete control over these minima in, in many ways. That's right. So actually, buried in my list of assumptions w was one that said that I can describe the string theory landscape at least at this level. Uh, as a set of scalars with this potential. And in that case, we really do know what these look like. Yeah, yeah I want to get to, uh, again, to what uh, Lev is uh, referring to, uh -huh. maybe, but, um, <coughs> which is that it may be in the uh, landscape minima, mm -hmm. the collective degrees of freedom are quite different. Mm -hmm. uh, and in particular, of course, there are different configurations for fluxes, et cetera. So um, it means that you're going from apples to oranges 
possibly. And it may be that the usual way of calculating the, uh, uh, the um, instant time uh, won't be accurate because the barrier includes all sorts of other degrees of freedom that are not being included in the uh, tunneling calculation. Right, so this is a good, this is a good point. I, it can be addressed at least to some degree. So for example, one can construct instantons which are charged, so where you actually have a brain that appears um, and, and changes the flux numbers. I'm talking about something much more complicated, which is that uh, the usual scenario is that the uh, height, mm -hmm. which is not necessarily true, but that the height is sort of m plump to the four fish. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and as you go up there, you expect all sorts of other degrees of freedom to be opening up. And so to actually calculate any sort of tunneling rate, et cetera, presumably you have to take that into account, and of course it isn't. And it certainly isn't. In well, I, I, I think, I mean, or, or ordinarily, just from decoupling, we, we, we can use effective field theory to describe uh, situations like that without worrying too much about what happens at very high scales. So, so, so there's, well, well basic. Why is, why is it that it is that the high energies don't matter for the tunneling rate? Well, it's, it's a fact about effective field theory. When you, when you integrate out massive degrees of freedom, uh, you, you can describe these processes entirely. So as, as, long, as, as long as nothing happens during the tunneling, where the energy density gets extremely high, and, and nothing like that actually does happen, at least most of the time, uh, it's, you're, you're perfectly uh, okay to use effective field theory. The, the issue is, that, isn't it, that you made an assumption in your list of assumptions, and you were quite explicit about it, that you could use an effective field theory description from what you were discussing. And right. if you can use effective field theory description, if you have a sensible cutoff, ultraviolet cutoff in this problem, then, yeah, integrating out but, but, also, but, but that's an assumption. It's not. I'm not aware exactly. of that. No, no, I know. It's, it's, it's I was an just assumption. Where the assumption is being made. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah it's, it's, it's certain. But, but, but also, it's a big assumption. Right. Just big assumption. We are trying, we're trying to digest what exactly goes in it. Right. But, but, but one question is the rate of inflation, and the other question is the structure of the transition, actually, of the walls. The part that I actually need to I, I know, so this yeah. is, but the yeah. trouble is, all of the things that people are doing now are just harking back to the old Col Coleman picture. It isn't yeah. like there's new technology out there, as far as I can see. Well, I'll, I'll come to it. The, there, there is some new technology. Yeah. technology. Yeah, right. And, and in fact, the, the thing that I really need is actually this issue of the structure. It's this SO4 invariance of the instanton. The actual rate is not terribly important in this. So, but maybe I should, maybe we should postpone this uh, discussion until afterwards. Well, uh, oh, okay. So, 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 all right. Um, <clears throat> so, how does one how does one study this process? So, I said there's a way to use these instantons to do it. Um, you, you don't need to understand the details of this necessarily, uh, but um, this this is a metric, and it's the analog of the WKB path. It's the analog of the tunneling through the barrier. It's something that takes place in Euclidean time. You can think of it that way if you want. Um, this solution has a characteristic that I mentioned briefly. It has an SO4 invariance, um, but, but, um, but let me move through that. What one, can draw, one can draw a picture of it, and this indeed is the coleman de Lucha, uh, solution, although not necessarily in the thin wall limit, um, which looks roughly like this. So the thing is, is roughly a sphere. It's actually a sphere in four dimensions, so that's hard to draw. Um, but it's a sphere whose radius changes as you move from one pole to the other. So it's not exactly a sphere. It's a bit warped. But it, it has, a, it has a symmetry. Um, you can rotate around this axis. That's a symmetry. Uh, and things only depend on this angle, on the angle from, uh, from the pole, so the latitude, if you want. OK. Um, now, it turns out this thing does two things for you. It calculates the rate of the transition. And it also tells you what the space time looks like afterwards. And, um, and the thing that I really need to use is this, uh, the, the, the part about how the space looks afterwards. And the only thing that goes into that, actually, is this SO4 invariance. So just to give you a, an idea of how that works, you start with this Euclidean time solution, and you analytically continue it. Um, this is a bit like if you tunnel through a barrier in quantum mechanics, that tunneling happens in imaginary time, in, in Euclidean time. But the motion after that, the particle will appear on the other side of the barrier, and then it will roll down and maybe oscillate into the new well. That motion, where it, where it falls down, um, can be obtained from the instanton, from this imaginary time formalism, just by 
multiplying time by i. Anyway, there's, there's a way to get the, the solution afterwards, starting from the instanton. And what you find is this, this metric, which should look familiar. Uh, it's, an, it's a Robertson-Walker, Friedman-Robertson-Walker metric. This H3 is open universe. It's usually written in terms of k with, uh, with r and k, and k would be minus 1. Um, H3 stands for hyperbolic three space. But anyway, it's, it's just the standard metric that you're used to, um, but with k equals minus 1, so negative curvature. Um, and, and moreover, the, the, the field that actually tunneled only depends on this time. In other words, it's homogeneous along these slices. OK, so this is a very special kind of Big Bang. Um, and to see why. Uh, so so, so what, what is special in this picture from a string theory? What's special from string theory? Is that what you said? Uh, it's, what do you mean? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's relatively standard so far. Yeah. Uh, but, but from the cosmology point of view, it's actually <laughs> remarkable. Because one of, the, one of the features of this, one of the interesting facts about it, is that there's actually no singularity at the Big Bang. Um, and you can see that in this picture. So this point is the point where the bubble appears. Uh, this is, by the way, a conformal diagram. I, I apologize if you're not uh, used to these diagrams. So vertical axis is always time. Horizontal axis is space. And the virtue of using this kind of diagram is that you pick coordinates in such a way so that uh, light rays, things moving at the speed of light, are 45 degree lines. Anything that's massive that can't move at quite the speed of light must follow a trajectory that's, at, that's closer to vertical than 45 degrees. Okay, so the bubble appears at this point. Its walls expand at the speed of light. Actually, its walls would be one of these blue lines out here. So they accelerate and very rapidly uh, asymptote to this 45 degree line. Um, and this metric that I wrote down here, this open universe, describes everything inside this light cone. So these blue curved lines in here are hyperbolic slices. Um, these vertical blue lines in here, uh, as you move along them, time is changing. Um, and, and so you can see from this picture maybe how it's possible for an open universe, which after all is infinitely big, to fit, in size, to fit inside a bubble which is sort of finite. If you, if you decided to use variables like these red lines, the bubble would appear at this time, and then here it's a certain size, here it's bigger, so it appears and it's expanding. And that's kind of the most uh, intuitive way to think about it. But if you're only interested in the interior, you can choose a different set of coordinates, which are simply an open universe. So, um, um, and, and, and then things evolve exactly like they do in cosmology with negative curvature. The fact that the scalar depends only on this time, that tells you that it's homogeneous along these open universe slices. So this is an honest goodness open universe. And it just has this strange feature that the Big Bang, t equals zero, is actually not a singularity. Everything is completely regular here. So that's one of the reasons why uh, one can make some predictions about this. Yeah, but the full manifold, of course, has to The? The full manifold has to Yeah, well, the, the d appearance of the bubble is not something that you can describe with classical geometry. But it doesn't involve any particularly large curvatures. There's no true singularities. Is this is this past? Yeah, it's that's right. Oh, if you went very far back in the past. Yeah, this, this doesn't say that uh, we understand the origin of the Big Bang and we can continue all the way back. Because at some earlier time that I'm not drawing, yes, something had to happen. Yes, right. But the thing that we see as the Big Bang, the thing where, where, um, where densities appear to go to infinity, that's actually not uh, a singular point. There's, there's no singularity there. And it's because if you were to go back in time, you would see all the matter in the universe contracting. It would melt into radiation. That radiation would all uh, go into this scalar drive it up the side of its potential just at exactly the right speed so that there was no singularity. R running that movie back in time looks very bizarre, but that's the usual case. Right? Running back in time, the entropy decreases, and things look weird. So anyway, that's one of the interesting features of this. OK, but um, I can't read that clock at all. All right, fine. <coughs> OK, so. so um, Right, so one of the things that, um, that's necessary in this picture, when this bubble appears, it's actually extremely homogeneous inside. And it also has curvature which is very large at the moment that it appears. It's, it's very strongly negatively curved. So I'm just talking about the inside of the bubble using these FRW coordinates, these robinson Walker coordinates. So we actually need, we need the bubble to inflate if we're going to produce anything like the universe we see, because we don't see large negative curvature. So we need the bubble to inflate. And this number 60 is just some uh, uh, fiducial number. But there's some number of e-folds that's required, which depends on things like the reheating temperature that we don't know precisely. But we need basically enough inflation so that um, curvature today is not large. It has to be within, say, experimental bounds. So um, 
That can happen in these models because um, after this tunneling event, the field doesn't appear in its minimum. It doesn't, it doesn't appear in the minimum, um, uh, like right directly in the minimum. It actually appears on the slope of the potential, and it then rolls down. And while this isn't particularly natural, if the slope of this potential is gentle enough, inflation will occur after the tunneling. So inflation occurs inside the bubble, blows it up, makes it really big, and, and stretches out the curvature. Uh, what do you mean that this homogeneous? <laughs> it's created with a finite size, yes. Um, it's just that... And uh, the walls are very sharp? Or what? The walls actually don't really need to be sharp. So what I mean by homogeneity is along these slices, nothing varies very much. So the statement in the, in the original instanton is that, um, is that it's symmetric rotating around this axis. If it's perfectly symmetric around that axis, it would be perfectly homogeneous when it appears. It's not perfectly symmetric because there are quantum fluctuations, but they tend to be much smaller than the curvature. And so it just isn't, uh, I, I don't think you can get, um, without inflation, I don't think you can get something which is consistent with, with what we see. <coughs> but still, it's interesting that in this case, the Big Bang is too homogeneous, not too inhomogeneous. It's just also too curved and, and, and you have to inflate away this curvature. Okay, so fine. So, so what can we say about this without now thinking about collisions with other bubbles? Just this bubble by itself. Uh, basically, I already said this. It's negative. Um, it's, it's, sorry, it's open. It's, its curvature is negative. Um, and there's more you can say if, if, you, if there hasn't been such long inflation that there's still some remnant of that curvature. So for example, if we measured negative curvature, then there's also a particular power spectrum um, in the large scale perturbations in the CMB. Which, um, which one could look at. Um, but lots of inflation inside the bubble ruins everything. It just inflates it away and makes it look homogeneous, flat, it's boring. Okay, so, 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 that's, so that's sort of the, the caveat here, that lots of inflation inside um, inflates away this, this initial inhomogeneity, this, initial, this interesting initial state. Okay, but I want to move to, to uh, what I think is actually more interesting. Um, <coughs> If these bubbles can appear once, if they're an allowed process, they'll continue to appear in the false vacuum, in the vacuum outside. So I didn't say this, but the vacuum outside is inflating itself. And since it has more energy than the vacuum inside, it actually inflates faster, which means that as this beer is bubbling, it's also expanding. There's always more and more uh, beer. And so there's always room for more bubbles to appear. And this process never ends. It goes on forever. This is called eternal inflation, at least as far as anyone knows. So there's always some false vacuum outside the walls of our bubble. And if another bubble appears there, it's going to run into ours, or ours is going to run into it as it expands. And in fact, this is guaranteed to happen. And if you wait sufficiently long, it's guaranteed to happen an arbitrary number of times, because there's always false vacuum outside, and there's some rate per unit time for these bubbles to appear. So these bubbles will eventually collide with each other. Ours will eventually collide with another one. <coughs> okay. And, um, and so it's interesting to ask what we would see. So, so we're in this bubble, it's expanding. Uh, another one appears, we run into it. This can happen more or less at any time during the evolution of, um, of the universe. So what do we see? What, what are the observable signatures, if any, of this thing? It turns out that one can actually find exact solutions uh, to Einstein's equations describing this collision. Um, that's not quite as hard as it sounds. So generally finding exact solutions to Einstein's equations when you don't have perfect spherical symmetry or something is hard. For example, two black holes merging, that's, that's impossible. Um, so it, it might sound unbelievable, but in fact, it's not that hard because of this. There is actually an extra symmetry. It's not a full spherical symmetry, but there's a, a rotation invariance, and that makes it easier to find these solutions. So I believe there were they, they, they did a, a special case, that's right. So, so this, that, they were the first to, to, to notice that there was this extra symmetry. They did the case, um, I think in the case where the two bubbles have zero cosmological constant and the background space has positive. So there's a generalization of this which we were able to find in which you can have any, pos any cosmological constant, positive or negative, in these bubbles. Uh, this has to be positive. Um, and oh, also the, the Hawking, Moss, and Stewart case, the bubbles were identical. And there's, there's two interesting cases. Well, it, actually, it doesn't matter for finding the solution, but it matters a lot for what you see from the inside. So I'll, I'll describe that in a second. So, so um, right. So anyway, you, you can find these solutions. You can exploit this symmetry to, to find these solutions. Um, sorry? 
It's an SO2 comma 1. It's a hyperbolic, uh, it's the symmetries of H2. It's basically, it's the analog of finding a Schwarzschild metric where the horizon is hyperbolic instead of uh, spherical. Yeah, sorry, when the question, Oh, okay. Um, anyway, so, so, so one can find this solution. Um, all right. Um, and and it's, it's nice because, um, well, because when you have an exact solution, you can, you can study it. You can ask uh, what, what, what are the observables going to be in that exact solution. Um, and, and this is something that's normally hard to do in cosmology. Normally in cosmology, we assume we have a homogeneous and isotropic universe, and then we do perturbation theory around that. Uh, here we have something which is neither homogeneous nor isotropic. Um, it was until this other bubble collided with us, but that other bubble, it collided with us from some direction, so it breaks isotropy. It also breaks homogeneity because if you're closer to it versus further away, you see something different. So this is an inhomogeneous and anisotropic uh, cosmology now, and, um, and, and, and so we can, we can ask about it. So one burning question is uh, when, when two bubbles of a different type collide, there has to be a wall between them because in, let's say, our region of the space-time, um, these extra dimensions in string theory or whatever, these fields are in one minimum. In the other bubble, they're in some other minimum. So there's a transition as you go from one to the other. Uh, and that transition region, generally speaking, is sharp when the two bubbles are different. It's a, it's a thin wall, so this transition happens suddenly. And that wall can, can do something. It, it can either move towards you or it can move away from you. And it does that because there's a pressure. It wants to move into the region that has higher energy and, and eat it up. It's just like when the bubble first appeared, it wanted to expand. Uh, when, when they collide, the domain wall wants to accelerate one way or the other because there's a pressure. Where did you replace it? jump from higher exposure to lower exposure Right. Yes. And then uh, reheating occurs. Yes. Okay. That's right. And you follow the solutions for all, all sorts of uh, regimes? No. So, so you, the exact solution is only valid <coughs> when, uh, there's pure, when you model it as having a cosmological That's constant right. inside. That's my question. Yeah. That's right. Now, otherwise, so if you want to include things like radiation domination, et cetera, you're trying, then it's as difficult as finding a black hole solution embedded in, in FRW, um, which, which is, which is you hard. Just extrapolate yeah. what they have. Yeah. So, so as, long as, as long as what's going on in here, as long as the energy density is relatively small compared to the false vacuum energy density and so forth. It's, and but it's also, <coughs> a lot of different scenarios when they collide, mm -hmm. there may be breezes forming between the walls. Right, well, so when the bubbles are the same type, what often happens is that um, there, there are kind of two walls that fly through each other, leaving a region of false vacuum in between them. Yeah. And, and then they, they get pulled back and they oscillate. Yeah. And it's actually these oscillations are radiating away. Exactly, right. So, that, that's, yeah, so that, but that, that only happens when the bubbles are of the same type. Eventually those walls decay because th there's not really a topological wall there. So the, the case that we focused on is the case where the bubbles are different, in which case the wall can't decay. And it, tends, it doesn't tend to oscillate, it just accelerates one way or the other. It may start off moving towards you and then move away because it's accelerating, but it's, its acceleration is more or less constant. Yes. <laughs> the physics in, in the other bubble? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. But as, well, m m maybe let me come to, to what we could possibly see. And the, the observables that we can see are mostly associated with the motion of this wall rather than exactly what's going on in the other bubble. Anyway, so this is a schematic of this picture. So in, in my, okay, so he, this was one bubble forming. Another <laughs> bubble forming would, would make another light cone over here. And it would collide with this one when those light cones overlap. So, um, oops. Well, yeah, okay, so, so here's a picture of that. Um, this is, let's say, our bubble. This is another bubble. This line, this is a line at, that's more vertical than 45 degrees, so this is a line um, of some physical object. For example, the Earth uh, may appear somewhere along this line. So this is a, a line that's roughly co-moving with the cosmology inside the bubble. <coughs> so this is us, let's say. Um, and, um, and you can see that, that there, there are sort of three regions in here. Uh, if, if we live in this region, then we, so the, the virtue of these diagrams is that they tell you what's causally connected to what. If something is, is not in your past light cone, you can't see it. If we're in this region, this other bubble, when it appeared, was not in our past light cone, so we see nothing at all. We see a completely standard, well, open, but other than that, completely standard universe. If we're in this region, however, we're within the future light cone of the nucleation point of this other bubble, which means we have a chance of seeing it. 
And here we, um, we can see it even more strongly. So if this is the surface of last scattering, uh, then um, the reason I've divided, well, I'll explain a little bit why I've divided these two. But basically, you may see a part of the surface of your CMB sky may, um, may include a part of the surface of last scattering, which is affected by this other bubble, but not strongly. Or it may be really dramatically affected by it uh, because the, the domain wall has actually come into it. All right. OK, so I mentioned this. It's just that this, this domain wall, which appears, accelerates into the region with higher energy. Um, so because we live in a bubble with very small uh, positive energy, we're, we're safer in some sense from these collisions because um, if we collide with a bubble with larger vacuum energy, which is almost certainly what we would collide with, the domain wall that forms will want to move away from us. It will want to eat up this region of higher energy. So there's some interesting sense in which um, having very small cosmological constant um, it makes you safer. But um, OK. So, so, w so what are the actual things that you could see, uh, given that the wall is moving away from you? If the wall accelerates towards you, you don't see anything interesting because it moves at the speed of light almost immediately. And the second you could see anything, you're, you're dead. If this wall runs into you, that's the end of the world. Uh, the bubble on the other side has some other laws of physics. And so that's it. So that's not very interesting. It's more interesting to ask about the case where the wall goes away from you. Um, and, then, and then what can you see? What, what, what kind of uh, effects will you have? OK. So, um, so that depends, roughly speaking, on two parameters. It there's some more parameters. It depends on weekly, but it depends strongly on two parameters. Uh, it depends on which of the co-moving observers we are. So because homogeneity has been broken, um, some observers are closer and some observers are further away. They were, before this, they were equivalent. So which of those we are matters. That's parameterized by this beta. In an open universe, you can think of this thing as a boost, as a, as a velocity uh, around this point, but it's just uh, different co-moving observers. And the other thing that matters is when, um, when this occurs. So when do we come into the, the future light cone of this collision event? Those are, the, roughly speaking, the, the parameters that matter the most. <coughs> so this is a, um, this is a solution uh, um, which we found analytically, but, um, but it's plotted. There's a little bit of numerical uh, stuff in here. Um, and wh what these lines are, these blue lines are surfaces of, um, let's say, constant infoton field. Uh, prior to the collision. This is, this, is what the, this is what the surfaces would have looked like if there had been no collision. So these are homogeneous open slices. Um, this green line is the domain wall. So over here is really another bubble. And this black line is the, uh, the light cone of the other bubble. So, so it's only after you pass into this region that anything can be affected. Imagine that this is, is us. This, this vertical black line is us. This is our past light cone. And let's say this is the surface of last scattering. So uh, in the region outside the light cone, it's unaffected. But um, in the region inside the light cone of this collision, the last scattering surface is, um, is not the same as it would have been had there been no collision. It's, it's moving with some velocity. So the fact that it's at an angle, uh, this is, again, this is time and this is space, tells you that it's, in some sense, it's in motion. Um, <clears throat> that has an effect on the CMB for various reasons. Wh one of the reasons is that inflation ended in this picture uh, later in that region. And also, that part of the space is not co-moving with respect to us, so there's also a Doppler shift. Um, how much time do we have? All right. <coughs> okay, so, so, um, so various things are affected by this. Now, I've, I've sort of exaggerated this in drawing it. Uh, if it was really, if the effect was this big, we would know about it. There would be a, um, a very obvious effect on the sky. Um, but okay, so what, what is the effect? If you can imagine uh, this, the figure of rotation of this, so if you can imagine rotating it around this axis, that's a two plus one dimensional universe, so that's getting, a, getting somewhere. So this, this pair of lines becomes a cone. And, um, and the circle, which is the intersection of that cone with the last scattering surface, that's the CMB sky. And if you can, if you can visualize it, this is a plane here. Um, so the part of that circle, which is affected, is this is the center of it in the, in the plane of this diagram is the center. And as you rotate at some angle, you pass through that plane. In other words, there's, there's in this two plus one dimensional universe, a, a, a section of this, of this circle, which is affected. In the real universe, that's a disk, right? So there's a disk whose center is the direction towards the other bubble and whose angular radius uh, depends on when the collision occurred. Uh, so those uh, red lines have to go up. So it, it, I mean, you couldn't have some I, some discontinuity in the wall. 
Oh, um, well, first of all, they, they actually can bend down sometimes. It, depen it, depends on, um, it depends on the characteristics of the other bubble. So this is one of the things that does depend on the other bubble. But in general, there, there won't be a discontinuity. There'll be a discontinuity in the derivative in some approximation, which of course will be smoothed out by various effects. But, um, but yeah, so, so in some cases they bend up, in some cases they bend down, which means you can either, so what's the effect? Uh, it can be a hot spot or it can be a cold spot or it can be something a little bit more complicated, depending on how these lines bend. If inflation, yes. yes. So, so what would be if two bubbles are, were actually of the same type? Uh, that changes things a bit. So, so then there's not a domain wall between them. Uh, yeah. There's just some stuff. Right. And that stuff tends to inflate away more rapidly. So, so it's, uh, actually I haven't analyzed that case in detail. In the, in the string theory landscape, there are this enormous number of possibilities. And so at least in one way of thinking, it's unlikely that we'd run into a bubble that's exactly like ours. Um, but it's, it's a little different then, that, that there's, there's, the <laughs> cosmology is a little different. Okay, but anyway, yeah, so what is the effect? So if there's a region where inflation ended later, then everything else being equal, it will be hotter because it be heated later, and so that region had less time to redshift. Um, and in this picture, actually, the spot here would be hot because of that. There's also this Doppler shift you have to take into account, so it's a little more complicated than that. But you can, you can work it out, and in the end you find that you can, this effect will generate either hot or cold spots. Um, which are which are disks, and the temperature depends only on the angle from the center of the disk. So the whole thing is symmetric, rotating around that that direction. So these are some spectra that we generated using this um, using this solution. So I want to emphasize, I'm not saying that this is what this will do because it depends on these two parameters rather strongly. So so the magnitude of the effect depends on how close we are, and the uh, size of the disk that's affected depends on when it happened. Um, but, uh, but here, are two, here are two possibilities. This is one that's something like 10 degrees across. Um, and um, what I'm plotting here is uh, the CLs as a function of L. So this is CL as a function of L. But CL normalized by CL without the collision. So, so this is the, the size of the effect from this collision. Um, and, and in this set of parameters, it's, it's relatively small. It can be larger or smaller, depending again on how close we are to the bubble. Um, this is for the same model. The difference is that here I'm plotting the hemispherical power asymmetry. I'm doing this just because it's something that various people have computed with the CMB. Uh, it turns out there is some asymmetry. There's, there's an axis um, where if you compute the power in, in, say, the northern hemisphere with respect to that axis uh, divided by the power in the southern hemisphere, it's different from one and it's significantly different from one according to them. It's just shining ring, right? <laughs> It's not a ring, it's a, it's a disk. Shining disk. Yeah. Yeah, with, with a temperature gradient, which, which, um, which more or less goes to zero at the edge and is maximized at the center, right. So in fact, these are not really the right statistics for looking at it. You don't want to compute the Fourier transform and then plot the CLs because this is an anisotropic thing. It's localized. So the only reason I'm doing this is that it's what most people compute. And so it's interesting to compare it to, to just to see how big the effect is. Okay, so, so it will give you a, a power asymmetry automatically because it happened in one hemisphere and not the other. Yes. And uh, in particular, there won't be stuff in it. There won't be? Stuff in it. It probably mm -hmm. have you know, really large lambda. Right, right. right. That's, that's fine. That's, that's essentially what I'm assuming. So, so the, the only thing that really goes into this is the motion of this domain wall. So after the bubble collision occurs, there's a wall between us and the other bubble. That wall um, sweeps out some trajectory. And what we see are the, are the effects of that wall. So, so it doesn't go with the speed of flight. It does, but sometimes it starts coming towards you at the speed of light and then it kind of gets away, sometimes it goes away. But um, it, it's still, so, so roughly, I mean, one of the reasons that it affects us is that the inflaton field, um, when it gets near the wall, is, is pulled towards it or pulled away from it, depending on, uh, on exactly how the potential is. So, so the photons cross the wall? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. Um, I think it's generally true that if you have a wall with a very high tension and a, and a, and a very thin one, it reflects uh, particles with, with wavelength much longer than that scale. I, I, I know this only in several examples and, and I don't have a, a very good proof. So it's possible that particles could come through from the other side or pass out from our side. However, inflation tends to inflate those things away more than it inflates away these effects. So. 
yeah, we really don't know the physics, so it's, it's hard to answer that. But whatever is coming through, it's, it's inflated away, and uh, so I don't think that's the easiest effect to see. So, so it's, yeah. So I, th I think the effects are stronger because this wall, the presence of this wall alters inflation, essentially, and then it alters the, the way in which the space reheats yeah. after inflation. But you consider only one instance, right? Only one yes, at the moment, this is one collision, right? Yeah, yes. Okay. Um, this is another model. This is a bigger, um, a bigger spot, which is why it affects lower L. Um, and this, is, again, is the, the hemispherical power asymmetry. <coughs> this, this one, by the way, was chosen so that it roughly reproduces the thing that's called the W map cold spot by some people. So there's some uh, spot which is roughly 10 degrees across. Um, and, and, so, and so I just picked the parameters. Um, and you can reproduce something similar to that. Um, but yeah. this could be done 20 years ago, right? Yeah. Although I don't know, I'm not sure the motivation would have been there, but absolutely. Well, there was. Yeah. It was lots of motivation for this sort of thing because, um, the, you know, it was the sort of a foamy picture of the universe that emerged uh, right, right. Right after the uh, right. large scale structure discovery. So, um, it, 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 and in fact, people looked at this sort of thing, but not with such uh, details. Um, so, c can you just say exactly what parameters you feel that you have control over in terms of dialing in order to get something that fits the observable? What are you actually... Sure. Um, what, 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 what exactly are you tuning? So, the, so the, the two parameters that matter the most are, um, are first of all, the, the w which of the formerly co-moving observers we are. So in other words, whether we're closer to the bubble collision or further away from it. That's what I call beta here, because it's like a boost around this point. And then the other parameter that matters is uh, at what time the other bubble collided with us. So and, and the physics interior to that bubble are completely irrelevant. Not, not completely, but um, so the trajectory of the domain wall depends on the energy density in here versus the energy density in here. So for example, if we assume that the other bubble has positive lambda, which is large, then that's enough. We don't need to know much more about it than that. What's that? They yeah, they, they, it doesn't yeah. make any difference what that value is. Um, not much, because it just changes the acceleration, but the acceleration is already so high that the thing uh, flies away very rapidly. So yeah, it's, it's, it matters to some extent. But, but um, what actually matters more, um, if you look at this picture, which unfortunately is, OK. Yeah, so, so um, if, you, if you take a very simple model where there's just one scalar, then this other bubble corresponds to a minimum which is either over here or over here. And this domain wall is, uh, is a boundary condition for this scalar, which is either over here or somewhere over here, depending on where the thing came from. And that affects inflation in very different ways. It either pulls it along or it holds it back, depending on which direction it came from. But so we, we can, maybe we can talk about that uh, afterwards if you want. But, all right. Sorry? Oh, yeah, that's, I didn't expect, that, that's a parameter, it's, it's just, um, it has to do with how strong the effect is, how, how big the temperature is in the middle. So, if I remember right, this is the, well, anyway, it's, it's related to the height of this bump. It's, it's how strong the effect is. <coughs> yeah, sure. Okay, so, so, um, Okay, well, I just wanted to say one or two more things. So for, first of all, li like I mentioned, I don't think that taking the Fourier transform is not the right way to find these. Um, I'm certainly not an expert on this, and, and, and maybe other people uh, know a better way to do this, but I would think that finding these things would be better done with either wavelets um, or some sort of brute force method where you just pick locations, you look at the temperature in a disk around that position, you look for the position that maximizes that, maybe you vary the radius, and then you compare that to some Monte Carlo to see if it's significant or not. Um, anyway, it should be something which is sort of local uh, in, in, in position space, not, not something that's in Fourier space. One interesting aspect of this, I mentioned that since this, the reheating surface and, and also the less scattering surface, but in particular the reheating surface is modified, it's actually moving with respect to the other part of the reheating surface. So there's no longer a co-moving frame in which everybody is, is homogeneous. Um, and actually what that means is that uh, if you can see that part of, of the universe, the part that formed from, from the affected reheating surface, then structures over there should have some kind of coherent peculiar velocities. Um, and I was interested to see 
uh, paper recently which claimed uh, that, well, I'll mention that towards the end, but anyway, which claimed something like that. I, I don't really know how strong this effect is. Uh, I haven't computed it, but it's clear that something like that is there um, because things which formed in the affected part of the reheating surface will have, on average, a motion with respect to, to us. Um, okay, so there's, there's somebody asked, uh, Lev, you asked, what, what, this is just one bubble collision. How many should we affect? Uh, sorry, how many should we expect? Um, and that's, that's a very good question, um, but maybe I don't have time to discuss it. It's something that I'm actually working on. Uh, it's the thing I'm working on the most at the moment. Um, Okay, so just uh, as sort of to conclude, there are some interesting anomalies in cosmology and how seriously you take them is a matter of taste. They tend to be about, you know, 1% uh, likelihood. There's only one sky. There are a lot of statistical tests you could do. So you may just say, well, you're always going to find some things that are significant at that level. If you look enough, I don't know. Anyway, there are, there are some anomalies. One of them is this WMAP cold spot, which, uh, which looks like this in the data. If you, if you smear it, um, uh, then it looks like this. So this, um, this is something like what you could get out of this model without much difficulty. Um, and this is something that I just mentioned. So there's this, uh, this measurement of the peculiar velocity of clusters um, done over some large part of the sky, which should be, that should be, um, the, the, the peculiar velocity of any cluster should be a random variable. It should average to zero. Um, that's the velocity relative to the CMB rest frame. But instead, when they did this average, they found some something not zero. It's very statistically significant, but I would think the systematics are, are very difficult in that. So I don't know how seriously to take this either. But uh, anyway, that's, that's also interesting. Um, okay. So, um, right. So just to conclude, I've said more or less everything I wanted to say. There's a, there's a lot to do on this. I think the biggest question is how likely it is that this is actually there. Um, theoretically, should we really expect it to be there? And then also, uh, can we look for it in the data? Um, can we be confident that something like, I mean, what should we, what test should we actually do um, to see whether, whether this is possible? Uh, is there any connection to this thing that they call dark flows, this peculiar velocities, maybe to the cold spot? So anyway, um, okay, I'll stop there. <coughs> So that depends on the size of the, of the spot. Um, if, it's, if it's very big, then there is a big quadruple. So if, if you look back at, uh, at this one, so th this, is, um, this is pretty big. I, I, I've actually, oh, yeah, this is the cosine of the angular radius. So it's pretty big, and it affects the low Ls a lot. Uh, this one is smaller, so it doesn't affect them very much. And in fact, the quadrupole is suppressed relative to the multipoles near it just because there's a, there's a growing power here. So yeah, so it doesn't necessarily, I mean, it'll give you a big quadrupole if, if the thing is really big, uh, but otherwise not. Okay, so Matt is going to be with us today.